Hi, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell. Thank you for joining us for this mini distraction. Like our full length show, these minis will be different every time, only shorter. It's a busy world, and you don't have a lot of time. We get it. These episodes are for you. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Paul Nussbaum to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you so much. Well, you know, our show is is called Distraction, and, and uh, we talk about other topics. But what do you think, as a neuroscientist, the impact of living in this age of distraction is on our brains? Oh, I think it certainly has a, a major distraction. I've, I've been keeping my eye on um, some interesting research that's just come out in terms of uh, younger adults and their propensity to uh, mood disorder, uh, depending on how often they're engaged with their digital friends. Uh, you know, it certainly uh, tends to lead uh, the brain to be non-creative, if you will, in some ways, um, pretty task-oriented, at times obsessive, compulsive. So there, there's some trends there that are a bit concerning. It doesn't all have to be negative, but, uh, you know, it certainly is a different uh, society that we're living in, and, and by default, um, it's going to create different brains. And, and, and long-term, if you were advising someone my age, how should I keep my brain fit as I head with all the other baby boomers uh, into the higher risk years? Yeah, so, you know, what I tell my audiences, Ned, is that the human brain doesn't know how old it is, and it really doesn't care. Chronological age is Mm. like this myth that we've created all this insanity Mm. around. You know, I I poke fun, you know, we have the sayings, lordy, lordy, I'm 40, and, you know, when I turned 50, I had a balloon on my mailbox, and inside the mailbox, somebody put an invitation from a group in D.C. for me to join, and they're, you know, at 65, uh, you know, policies get built literally around chronological age, and it really is just all invalid. The brain just simply wants to be stimulated across the lifespan. I I call the brain the single greatest miracle ever designed, and it Mm -hmm. sits right between our ears. And it just wants to be stimulated. So that begins with, uh, regardless of age, understanding that. And um, that age really doesn't matter. And that it's important to get engaged in things that one is passionate about. Mm. Uh, creativity tends to be spawned quite a bit in late life. And there may be some reasons for that. But, uh, you know, there's been a lot of really smart people doing research on that. And I would say to any person at any age to stay critically involved um, in things that matter, that give you a reason for getting up each and every morning and contributing. And that, by definition, is a wonderful prescription for longevity and quality of life. To be passionately involved with something. Absolutely. That's that's the key. And um, everything else kind of follows from that, that, you know, if you're just kind of chasing the buck, chances are you're not going to find what you and I are talking about right, right. now. Right. But if you're doing something that, as I like to describe it, kind of gets you up, fired up in the morning, all the goodies are going to come along with that. But that's not going to be the primary reason for you getting up in the morning. It's going to be to do what it is you love to do. Then you don't even call it work anymore. And and how about the other end of the lifespan with, with children? If a parent is listening, you know, we live in an age of kind of force-feeding kids and trying to, you know, get them to take as many AP courses as possible, and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. What, what is your prescription for children? Yeah, so I, this is really a lifespan issue, and my work really is lifestyle-based, and I think about sort of a, a brain health lifestyle pie, if you will, so... Mm-hmm. You know, you and I have talked about one of the slices, socialization, and we're talking about mental stimulation now, but a third is spirituality, a fourth is physical activity, and a fifth is nutrition. And, Mm -hmm. you know, in my dream, every mom and dad-to-be before the baby gets born would know about this information so that the baby in the womb could really be exposed to kinds of environments that would begin to lay down the neural circuits of the brain, and then we have a two-year-old in front of us, what do we do? And then Mm -hmm. we have a 15-year-old, what do we do? And there's certain things that we want to expose the brain to across the lifespan. And we're not going to be perfect, but the earlier we can get started, which really goes to your question, the better off we're going to be. One of, one of the secrets that I've learned about growing older successfully and with quality of life is that we got to begin early in life. Uh, and, and if we do that, the chances of us having a, a very successful quality of filled life later is going to be uh, enhanced. So in my talks on on the basics of the brain and how to shape the brain for health, I find myself, believe it or not, in front of second graders and third graders, 
and I, I can just tell you that they're very engaged. They're very, very interested in this topic, as are all people, because it's really about self. It's really about who we are. It's, uh, it's the birthplace of our identity. Hmm. And, and if you're a child and, and you find school boring, what should you do about that? Yeah, that's a tough one, and I think trying to understand why there's boredom is important. Sometimes it's because the the content is just beneath the, the child's capacity. Mm-hmm. Sometimes because uh, there may be a little bit too much pressure either from the teacher or from, from home. But, you know, in a world where we want to teach learning and have the ability for the brain to create, we, we need to have environments that aren't, aren't as structured maybe as they are in some of our schools yes. because the minute we structure the brain, we limit it. And so creating opportunities for the brain to kind of express itself, if possible, within a school system would be something that could be quite helpful. If it's not, then I would suggest to parents that, you know, you look for those uh, alternative avenues of expression outside of the school. One of your five categories is spirituality. Yeah. Can you enlarge on that a little bit? Sure. I actually just finished a book uh, on this topic, and... um, you know, it, it began with observations of individuals over 25 or 30 years of my practice of, um, you know, seeing that folks are searching for things out there. They're searching for things. They're looking for ways of filling a hole in their life and, and oftentimes going to maybe a, a, a diet or a supplement or an exercise piece of equipment or this kind of thing. Uh, and my sense has always been that there's something deeper that's missing from, from people's lives. And so I called that spirituality, and I, what I was going for was just to, this idea of people trying to find balance in their life, which is so missing by so many of us in America because we're so rapid in our, in our activity. Um, mm. And, you know, part of that is formalized practice of religion, and part of that is kind of non-traditional practices of spirituality that might involve exposure to nature, mm-hmm. um, meditation, yoga, breathing exercises. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a lot of that here at my Brain Health Center. But I I took even a deeper dive recently, Ned, and and I wrote this book uh, that just came out. And really the book deals with the question of, you know, is there a greater purpose to the brain than simply a system that helps us with memory and thinking and relational ability, which is all very, very important. And I began to just probe the question as to whether or not, uh, you know, the brain was granted us by a higher being so that we could communicate with the higher being. And I took it from a, a, a Christian stance because I'm I'm Christian and so I thought that was a good place to start and you know looked at certain structures in the brain where yeah as an example we have the ability to love and to forgive and to have hope and faith and humility and these are all behaviors that we we've experienced and we actually have structures in our brain that permit us to do that uh, and these are lessons that go back uh, you know thousands of years uh, and it kind of represents a for me a, a spiritual prescription if you will mm. For uh, many of the people, at least that I see and that I've dealt with over the years, uh, who are searching, and so that's kind of what the book talks about. What's the um, name of the book? Yeah, the the name of the book is um, "What Is the Purpose of My Brain: Spiritual Healing and Salvation," mm. uh, and it's published by Tate T A T E. Mm. And I, I even kind of make a a little bit more than a soft nudge to my clinical peers out there to think about prescribing things like love and 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 forgiveness um those are those to me are very powerful spiritual medicines that really don't have any side effects well just to summarize your the five pillars or areas that you stress nutrition socialization physical activity mental stimulation and spirituality well what a treat to have you on this podcast i i can't thank you enough for joining me and and i admire your work tremendously Thanks, Ned. You're very kind. Thanks for taking time to to let me chat with you. Thanks a million. Take care. Bye-bye. Distraction is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcasts for curious people. Our music theme was created by Mark Berman.